Good morning. morning. I like it. I got a few announcements to make. First of all, we have small groups tonight. However, there will not be small groups tomorrow. The Monday group will not meet tomorrow, so I'll announce that. Also, in your bulletin also, let's see, if anybody's interested in performing in a white gloves ministry, um, they are meeting tonight, today, not tonight, right after the service. So it's for grades seventh and up. So meet if you're interested in doing that, and then you guys can talk about that. Um, the money challenge starts Wednesday at 6.30. That's this Wednesday at 6.30. Invite the people that you think might benefit from this, and hopefully they'll come. Uh, people I invited probably won't. All right. <laughs> also, um, oh, there's no youth group tonight. I don't know if I mentioned that. Pinewood Derby this year, quick announcement, may or may not happen. <laughs> so we're debating it. If we do it, it's going to change. And we are going to need some help. So if you're interested in helping do the Pinewood Derby, get a hold of Melissa or I. And we will discuss at that point whether we're going to do it. So I think that is everything that I have. You're up, Andy. All right. This morning, our first song is Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. So why don't you all stand and sing as we... Praise God together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, trust in finger at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the set the Lord. How I trust you, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust in cleansing blood, just to simple faith to him, Nate the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus. Just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply talking, life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace. To trust him more. I'm so glad I've learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that he is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more. Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. All right, we can be seated and we'll have our reflection time.
Our next song will be, O oh Lord, My Rock and My Redeemer. And as we had in our reflection time, I said, Christ didn't know sin, but God made him sin for us. Christ is our Redeemer. So let's stand and sing, O oh Lord, My Rock and My Redeemer. This time we'll have our ushers come for the offering. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you now and we thank you for this wonderful day and the opportunity we have to meet together as believers and worship you and learn from the preaching of your word. And I pray for this offering that you would bless it and that it would further the ministries of the church. In Jesus' name, amen.
And at this time, we will have special music from Josiah and Sabrina. Like Andy said, uh, and like we sang, uh, Christ is our rock, he's our redeemer. And because of that, he's also our hope in life and in death. Sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ our hope in life and death Unto the grave what will we sing Christ he lives, Christ he lives And what reward will heaven bring Everlasting life with him There we will rise to meet the Lord then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Christ our hope in life and death Oh sing hallelujah Our hope springs eternal Oh sing hallelujah Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death Thank you. All right, now we'll stand and sing day by day. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, 
time not seen us for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingled toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me, with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he faces bear and cheer me. He knows him a counselor and power. The protection of his child and treasure is a chance that on himself he lay. As your day your strength it should be in measure this the pledge to me he made help me then in every tribulation so to trust your promises O Lord that I lose no faces consolation of a free And our next song is You're My All in All. And on the last chorus, we'll go a cappella. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, my shame, and I cannot bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, Thank you. You may be seated, and the children can be dismissed for Children's Church. Well, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach your God's Word today. Um, as I was preparing, I was working through a couple different messages I could work with, but didn't really have any peace about them, so then. <laughs> so I decided to go with something that I'm familiar with that changed my life, something you guys are familiar with, and that is the gospel. You know, I could 
say, stand up here for five minutes and say what the gospel is. I'm not going to do that. It's going to be a couple, couple hours at least. <laughs> I'm kidding. At least I don't think it'll be a couple hours. That being said, there's, not, there's one, one specific passage that caught my mind, and that's 2 Corinthians 5.21. That's going to be our main verse that we're going to come from. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. We're going to be jumping around a lot, so I would encourage you, write down the verses, write down the passages, and then later you can go and exam examine them for yourself. A lot of people are praying for me, and I appreciate it. One thing I want to say is that what is about to be said is not me. This is not me speaking. This is all God's word that's being talked about. So if you have a problem with it, you have a problem with God's word, and it's not me. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he was made, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God, we thank you for this day. We're thankful for this opportunity to hear your word, to examine your word, to remember what the gospel is. A lot of us have become comfortable with, comfortable with it and just accepted it and moved on with our life. But God, for those, those of us who are Christians, those of us who are saved, help us to remember that the gospel is for us as well. To remember that it is not just for the unsaved, for the ungodly, but for those who have accepted it, Lord. Help us as we walk through Use your spirit to speak through me and use your word to go into hearts, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So for those of you who are Christians, before you're able to sh share the truth of the gospel, you must first have reliance and trust on it. If you do not believe the truth that we're going to talk about, then you will not be able to share in confidence the gospel. Truth is truth. It is not dependent on your perspective or acceptance of the truth. Truth is truth with or without you. In today's day and age, we are asked to prove what we believe in and to give proof that God really exists and that Jesus truly came, lived, and died. So the question I ask you is, can you prove your Christianity and what you believe? The answer is yes, because you can give enough evidence to prove what you believe. Enough in law terms means a preponderance of evidence, basically saying that a jury has enough evidence to convict or acquit somebody. So with that in mind, God gives us enough evidence so that we can test him. We can test him in, full, in fulfilled prophecies, archaeological and historical and scientific evidence of, God's, of the Bible's validity. This does not mean that we will know all the truth, because if we knew all the truth, there would be no point for faith in God. There are four truths that you can bank your life on. And there, these four truths are, one, the existence of a powerful and personal God. Two, Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again. The third truth is the reliability of the Bible. And the fourth truth is that the gospel message is our means of eternal life. Those are four truths that you can bank your life on. So what is the gospel? At the beginning of this, we're going to get the, the happy part of the story, you could say, from Genesis. So turn with me to Genesis, if you will. Genesis chapter 1. For those of you, you can take the word gospel and make it an acrostic, and that's what I'm going to do. So those are my main points. So our first point is G, the G in gospel, and it stands for God created us to be with him. Before we get into Genesis, Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. As we look in Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever co Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam... There was, no, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man, and, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Reading this passage, you can find so many things that people in this day and age are longing for. Adam and Eve had everything they could ask and wish for. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, and socially, they were completely fulfilled. A lot of people look for physical fitness. I'm not the best fit, but I also am trying, you know. People are trying to look the best they can, to eat the healthiest way, to do the best workout, to do this, to do that, to look the best that they can. Adam was in prime fitness and health. People want a job that can fulfill them. Adam and Eve were given three jobs from God. They were to take care of the garden, rule the animal kingdom, and fill the earth with their children. Emotionally, Adam and Eve were pure and unashamed, and they had emotional fulfillment in God. Socially, they had wealth and power. Adam and Eve were the only humans on planet Earth. They had complete rule and power over everything that was on the Earth. They were put in charge of everything. And spiritually, Adam and Eve literally walked, talked, and were with God in the garden. Not only did they walk, talk, and were with God in the garden, they did so without terror of a presence of a glorious God because they had no reason to hide. They had no reason to run. All of these things people are looking for, physical health, wealth and power, emotional, vocational, relational, and spiritual fulfillment. So God designed us to be in perfect relationship with him, to fit together, like one of my favorites, peanut butter and jelly, to fit together like salt and pepper go together, to fit together as my other favorite, Oreos and milk. But God designed us to be in perfect relationship with him. But as we get into point two, which is letter O in the gospel, we find where the story changes. And it's our sins separate us from God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Genesis 3, verse 1. There's one word at the beginning of that chapter that says, Now. Chapter 1 and verse 2, creation, perfect harmony with God, perfect harmony throughout all creation. Chapter 3 changes the story with the word now. 
Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord hath made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will, know, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. At that moment, Adam and Eve took of the fruit of the, took the fruit, and a giant chasm was created between God and man. One side of the chasm was sin, shame, death, hopelessness, and the other is eternal life, hope, love, peace with God. One commentator wrote. When Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, something deadly took place inside the inner caverns of their souls. They were corrupted. They became depraved. The cancer of selfishness and disease of pride spread throughout every fiber of their spiritual beings. Once destined to rule the earth, they now became slaves to sin and Satan. After they sinned, there's three reactions that they had after disobeying to God. Or for their first reaction they had was to cover their shame. In verses 6 and 7 of chapter 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. The second reaction they had was to hide from God in verses 8 and 9. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife had them, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? The rest of the Bible describes a cosmic hide-and-seek game where God searches for us, for humanity, but we are still hiding in the gardens of religion, philosophy, materialism, and hedonism. Yet God has never stopped calling out, where are you? To a lost, depraved, and hiding world. God will always call for his creation to come back to him until it's too late and that call will become silenced. The third reaction they had was to play the blame game in Genesis chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as one, though one man sin entered the world, and death through sin... And thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. Adam is the one responsible for the corruption, famine, and crime, and war because he was our spiritual representative before God. The best illustration I found was an illustration of George W. Bush declaring war on terror. He got up before everybody and said, we're going to make... This needs to stop, and I'm declaring war on terror. And hundreds of countries joined with him on the, on the war of terror. And it wasn't just him saying, hey, well, I'm declaring war on terror. But as represent, the representative of America, we all declared war on terror. This is the same thing. When Adam declared war on God, we all declared war on God when we sinned. What is the consequence of our declared war on God? It's an eternity away from God in a place of fire and brimstone, something we call hell. Hell represents something way more scary than just fire and brimstone. It represents God's hatred for sin because he knows how much sin can damage and destroy our relationship with him. Hell will burn forever forever 
because God's hatred of sin will burn forever. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Are you trying to cover your shame like Adam and Eve did? God's trying and calling out to you right now, and he wants to take your shame. He wants to take your sin from you. Are you trying to hide from God? In religion, in your philosophy, in your knowledge of the Bible, in your knowledge about political events, in materialism, are you trying to hide in what you own? In hedonism, in selfish pleasures, where are you trying to hide from God? Are you trying to play the blame game and blame others for your sins? God is calling you today and wants you to come to him. If you come to God, you're going to find hope and you're going to find love and you're going to find peace. The scariest thing about hell is not the presence of fire and brimstone, but the absence of hope and love. Our next point is S. Sins cannot be removed by good works. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. So i got a question for you. What are, what are some ways you have heard people say they're going to get to heaven? Baptism? Your works? Good outweighs the bad. I think the biggest one that most people hear is my good works will outweigh my bad. My, my good works will get me to heaven. But there's two big problems with the good works mentality. First one is one sin is enough to condemn you to hell. James 2.10, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Romans 3.10-12, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have not together become unprofitable. There is none who does, does good, no, not one. The standard of getting into heaven is perfection. The second problem is good deeds cannot cover up our sin before God. If I were to go home and grab my kitchen trash, grab my Christmas wrapping paper, wrap it all up, bring it to Christmas, and be like, here you go, Mom and Dad, here's my present for you. On the outside, well, I mean, I'm not the best gift wrapper, but it would look better. It would look better than just a trash bag. On the outside, it would look great. I could even put a bow on it. I could, like, write beautiful notes and make it look all nice and pretty and cute and so many other things. But as soon as you take off that wrapping paper, what do you find? Trash. If you're trying to get to heaven with your good works, it's not going to work. Even though you may look good on the outside, what's on the inside with the heart is what truly matters. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What may look like good works on the outside can actually come from a heart filled with selfish and sinful desires. But what do you put your sin up against to see if it's sin? Where, where's the measuring stick that you say, well, is this a sin or is this a sin? One thing we have is the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. If you want to turn with me to Exodus chapter 20.
we'll kind of walk through this kind of quickly, but this is your measuring stick to see if you're a sinner. Genesis, Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself any carved image, any likeness of anything that is heaven, in heaven above, or is that in the earth beneath, or is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations to those who hate me, but sh showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take your na the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day in the Seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. The first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. Have you ever put somebody before God? The second is no idols. Have you ever put something before God? Number three, do not use, misuse God's name. Have you ever said God's name in vain or in anger? <coughs> Number four, remember the Sabbath day. Do you take one day a week to rest and reflect on God? Number five, honor your father and mother. Have you always honored your father and mother with a good attitude? Number six, you shall not murder. 1 John 3.15 talks about if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Do you steal time from your employer? Do you steal attention? Do you steal glory that doesn't belong to you? Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Do not lie, which includes exaggerations and the little white lies that people talk about. Do not covet. Have you ever been jealous of what others have? One thing people need to realize is that the Ten Commandments and the law, the first five books of the Bible, were not given to us to show us how to get to heaven, but rather to act as a mirror and show us how broken and sinful we are and to show us how short we fall. So if you were to put this and put it up against your life, how many do you think you would have failed? All of us would have said at least one, if not ten. Which, according to James, for whoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So if you broke one of these, you're a sinner and you in need of a Savior. If heaven is a perfect place, then one sin is enough to keep you out. So we got through the letter G, O, and S, and now letter P. This is where the hope comes into the story. Letter P, paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. I want to say that again. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I've put together three pains that Jesus went through from Mark 15. Turn with me to Mark 15. I'm going to talk about the emotional pain that Jesus went through. Talk about the spiritual pain that Jesus went through. And then we'll end with the physical pain that Jesus went through, and I have something to read on that. 
Mark chapter 15. We'll talk about the emotional pain. Emotionally, he was rejected by the religious leaders. Chap- chapter 15 of Mark, verses 1 through 5. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consolation with the, chi- with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said, it, said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing. So that Pilate marveled. The religious leaders of Jesus' day and age rejected him. He was also rejected by the government in verses 6 through 15 and also rejected by the people in verses 13 through 15. Look down at verse 33. He was rejected spiritually. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because of the amount of sin that was on Christ, God turned his back on him. And the third pain that Jesus went through was physical pain. There was a study done through, based off of Jesus' crucifixion (coughs) that a college did, and they took all the information they had on crucifixion. And they wrote a whole article, and I just took a little bit of it, and I will say I'm going to read it, It is a little bit gruesome, but it's something that we should understand. So, scourging was an incredibly painful torture inflicted by a whip with multiple leather cords that that would commonly have bits of sheep bone and sharp pieces of metal and glass embedded throughout. This instrument was designed to inflict maximum pain and blood loss, as each lash would have ripped out large pieces of flesh essentially exposing the skeletal muscles completely. With his hands tied to a post, Jesus endured this horrific pain at the hands of the Roman soldiers as crowds of onlookers looked. And like many other things on that day, Jesus knew this was coming. After the scourging, Jesus has lost a massive amount of blood. His back has been literally ripped to shreds, and he would have been incredibly weak. At this point, Roman soldiers drag him away to the governor's palace where they would commence a new level of mockery and humiliation. Twisting together a crown of thorns, they ram the symbol of the curse given to Adam down on the head of the second Adam. With flesh, fresh blood running down Jesus' face, the soldiers begin to beat him over the head with a mock scepter, driving the thorns even deeper into his temples and forehead. When the horrific deal was complete, they rip off the mock royal robe and lead him outside the city walls to Golgotha, the hill of the skull. And now, already weakened and bloodied to the state of barely recognizable, Jesus is to be crucified. Again and again, Jesus is fulfilling scripture. Isaiah 52, written hundreds of years before this moment, the prophet had written, Many were astonished at you, His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Jesus had truly been marred beyond resemblance. And now for the crucifixion. Today when you hear the word crucifixion, you probably instantly think of Jesus. But back then, this was a method of torture, humiliation, and execution that ancient Rome Rome had used on non-citizens and criminals who had threatened Rome rule. It was a death reserved for the absolute dregs of humanity. Written in the first century, Mark would not have had to explain crucifixion to his audience. But we don't live in a time where this is a commonplace event. After being forced to carry the horizontal crossbeam throughout the streets, Jesus collapses, requiring a random stranger from the crowd named Simon to carry it the rest of the way. At the top of the hill, Jesus is thrown down on his back, irritating his already open wounds, 
They grab his hands, place iron stakes over his wrist joint, and drive these giant nails into them. He is lifted up and affixed to the vertical beam, now forming the familiar, familiar T of the cross, where his feet are now nailed as well. As well. The cause of death in a crucifixion was typically suffocation. With the entire weight of your body hanging on your wrists, you cannot properly exhale. Suffice it to say that for the next six hours, every single breath Jesus takes is literally excruciating. The cu cumulative physical suffering and pain Jesus endures throughout this execution is some of the worst imaginable in human existence. That's what Jesus went through to save you. Not only physically was he abused and destroyed, but his own father turned his back on him. His own friends, his disciples turned their back on him. The only record that we have of people standing with him were his mom and John and Mary Magdalene. And even though he went through all this, and he's up on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Then he looks at his mom and says, this is your son talking to John. And then he talks to John saying, this is your mother. Even through his pain and his suffering, he still cares enough to look after his mom, to look after his best friend. Jesus went through all of this for you. But why? Why did Jesus have to die? Hebrews 9.22 and according to the law, almost all these things are purified with blood, but without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. I'm going to turn over to that passage and continue reading. Hebrews chapter 9, <coughs> verse 23, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin and salvation. Jesus' death and resurrection give us hope of eternal life because the resurrection proves that Jesus is who he says he was. And he is the way to a restored relationship with God. John 20, verse 31, But these are written that you may believe in the Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. God's love and justice collide at the cross. Letter E. Everyone who trusts in him alone has salvation. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Trust is another word for believe. The word believe means more than just an intellectual or acknowledgement of Jesus' exi Jesus's existence. James 2.19, you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Rather, it means to trust or completely rely on. A complete trust and rely on God. The best way I could put that into human perspective is if Elise was on the roof for some random reason and she said, the, she, Pastor Aaron walked up to her and said, the only way for you to come off is for you to jump. And because she trusts her father, she says, okay, and full reliance on him, thrusts herself off the roof and into his arms. 
That's what trust means, is thrusting yourself into Christ and saying, I have complete reliance on you, and I'm trusting you for everything in my life. Eternal life is not a matter of trying, but trusting. And our last one, L. Life starts, life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. I'm going to use God's word to prove that point, and I'm just going to not talk anymore, but God's word is going to talk. John 10, 28, and I give them eternal life that they should never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Jude 1, 24, now to you who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. John 6, 37 through 39, all that the Father gives me, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by, by no means cast out. Romans 8, 38 through 39, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other th creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 7.25, therefore he who is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he has always lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 13.5, Let your conduct be without covetousness, being content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The beauty of being saved is not just what we're being saved from, but we're, what we're being saved to, and that's Jesus and God and eternal life. So after we walk through this, how, how does the gospel change lives? New life. My favorite character in the Bible is Paul. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9, and we'll look at how Paul's life radically was changed. Acts chapter 9, <coughs> verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by hand and brought him to Damascus. And three days without sight neither ate nor drank. Then verses 10 through 19 talk about the Lord appearing to Ananias and telling Ananias to go to Saul. And he says in verse 17, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road to you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some time there with the disciples at Damascus. Verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who call on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. 
Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the disciples, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, and they attempted to kill him. And when the brethren found out, they brought him to Caesarea and sent him to Tarsus. Paul, immediately as he could, immediately started proclaiming Christ as Son of God. But what should our life look like now because of the gospel? Ephesians 4, as we're talking in Sunday school, or we will continue to talk in Sunday school, is the fruits of the Spirit. Ephesians 4.20 is what we should look like with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Ephesians 4, verse 20, but, when you have not, what, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct the whole old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, each, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who steal, stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for the necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Chapter, one, verse, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Most of you have heard my testimony. I came to college my freshman year back in 2020 as a pastoral major. And then sophomore year comes around, and I realized I am not saved. And so I went and talked to our dean and students. He walked me through the gospel. And I've shared this before, but he said, Repentance is not a fear of consequence, but a turning away. In that moment, Christ changed my heart and changed my life. And I am forever grateful and indebted to him because of what the gospel has done in my life. So what now? You've accept, as a Christian who has accepted the gospel, what are you supposed to do with it? The most popular passage that most people turn to is Matthew 28. And that's the Great Commission. Verse 18 of chapter 28 of Matthew, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All the authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. 1 Peter 3.15. We should be hiding God's word in our heart, God's word and truth in our hearts so that we can give an answer to the hope that we have. If you're not being asked about the hope that's within you, are you representing Christ in the right light? With 1 Corinthians 2 in mind, when we are asked to share the gospel, share the good news to others, we tend to say to others, well, I just don't know enough about the Bible and know enough about the gospel, so I'm afraid that they'll ask a question that I won't know the answer to. There is some truth behind that because you should be constantly in God's word seeking 
truth and seeking how you can boldly share the gospel. But because you're human and you're talking about a spiritual matter of salvation, you will not be able to answer every question based on your own knowledge, but rather trusting that God will use the Holy Spirit to speak through you. We do not have an excuse for not sharing the gospel. Matthew 9, 36 through 38. But when he saw the multitudes, Jesus, he was moved with compassion on them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The gospel should be our sole passion and driving factor in our lives in any decision that we make. We should not be able to say that we do not know any unbelievers because according to this passage, the harvest truly is plentiful, meaning there are plenty of unsaved people even in St. Ansgar. Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, but then also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So as I close, if you have not received the gospel, I would encourage you and I pray for you that you would receive the gospel. That you would recognize that you are a sinner and in need of a savior. But then for those of you, for those of us that are Christian, that are saved, what are we doing with the gospel? The definition of gospel means good news. When we hear good news on our television, we instantly want to start talking about it. Right? So if this is good news, why aren't we trying to share it with more people? And my life verse, which I want to end with, is Hebrews 4.16. And you can come before Christ with this verse. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be as good as you can be, and you're still broken and you're not getting to heaven. But you can come to Christ boldly. Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the gospel for your good news that you've given to us. Thank you for sending your son to die the worst death in human existence so that we could just have a chance to be able to spend eternity with you. I pray for anyone in here who has not trusted in you on full reliance and salvation, that they would make that decision today. Nobody can make that decision for them. But I pray that they would make that decision to change their life because of what you've done in their heart and that they wouldn't be scared to do so because there could be some people in here who think they're saved, but your Holy Spirit is working in their heart. Lord, I pray that they would not be ashamed, but that they would ask questions and that they would pursue you wholly. Lord, you are a good God, but you're also a just God. And there's going to be a day when we all stand before you for what we've done on this earth. And Lord, the harvest truly is plentiful. I pray that this church would be sent out to proclaim the good news of the gospel to those of our neighbors, to those in St. Ansgar, for the college students, for us in Ankeny, for those at, at Faith, for in our workplaces, for our friends, that we would just share the gospel with anyone we come across. Thank you for your son. For the gift of salvation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you for that powerful message on the gospel, Jared. So our last song, we'll stand and sing, Your Mercy is anew.
Troy, would you ask this uh, prayer on this closing of this service? Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. The glorious sun shines out there today. Hey, you are dismissed.